Good morning, everybody. I'm Ankara from SUSE. I'm working in kernel for a long time. <laughs> Actually, mostly in file system area related block layer. I maintain a couple of file systems in Linux kernel and uh, also some quota subsystem and so on. So, uh, yeah, as, as Anne said, uh, this is the first talk about IO subsystem that Jens will continue with some new developments in that area. My talk will be more about really what's the basic architecture and how you can see what it's doing when you are debugging stuff, you know, when you want to understand what happens. So, first I will overview the basic architecture. I will then uh, introduce you to some tools which can show you what the block layer is actually doing, what IO is happening in the system. Uh, together with some examples like how to use the tools, uh, what problems, what kind of problems you can debug and so on. So, the architecture. So, on top you have user space, there are some processes running there and they communicate with the kernel which is in the middle. Uh, now, if you do I.O., then there are uh, two basic ways to do I.O. Either you do it directly via system calls, uh, so you somehow talk via system call interface to do VFS, which is just a generic Unix name for the file, generic file system layer. Uh, or you can do it via mmapped I.O., so basically you mmap and basically bind some parts of your virtual memory to files on disk and then just by writing to this memory you actually write to the files. So th then you go directly into page cache which is caching contents of the files on disk. Uh, then either page cache and VFS uh, talk to the individual file system drivers uh, which basically define on disk format so how the data is stored on disk. They define what are directories, how they are stored on disk, they, uh, and they define access permissions and a lot of stuff like that. <laughs> then these file systems talk to block layer, so they ask it questions like, you know, give me block this or read that many blocks from this offset on and so on. Uh, and block layer talks to the device drivers and device drivers talk to the actual hardware, which then <laughs> returns the data, hopefully. Uh, now, basically, I will concentrate mostly uh, to the block layer, which is here. Uh, and somewhat I will speak about the file systems, but only to a small extent. Uh, so, some basics. So, block layer works with I.O. requests, so it's all centered about handling and shuffling I.O. requests here and there. Uh, I.O. request is a thing which has a starting sector and length. It can be read, it can be write. And there can be also some special I.O. requests which do not carry any data. Uh, so these are, for example, like requests to discard part of the media. Uh, for example, this is usual for SSD disks where, where you have discard operation. Or it can be a request to flush write-back caches or so on. So, so that's also handled as an I.O. request, but it's kind of special because it doesn't have any data attached to it. Uh, each I.O. request can have also kind of hint attached to it. Uh, so example of a hint is that the request is actually synchronous, which means that someone actually waits for the I.O. to complete. So reads are usually synchronous unless this, it is read ahead. <coughs> Writes are sometimes synchronous. For example, when you call f-sync, then you actually actively submit the data to the disk and wait for, wait for it to complete. <laughs> Or when you use direct I.O., then again you submit the I.O. request and wait for it to complete. Uh, they can be also asynchronous for it because when you use buffered I.O., you just actually write the data into the page cache and then kernel, when it decides so, it will write back the data from the page cache to disk. So in this case, no one actually waits for the write. It's asynchronous and uh, so this hint may or may not be obeyed by the I.O. scheduling algorithms and they may decide on the priority of each I.O. request based on this hint, for example. And there are some other things. Uh, then you can have also other flags uh, attached to the I.O. request like uh, FUA, which means force unit attention. It's a shortcut for basically saying, I really want this write to go to the media. I don't want it to be in any write back cache. Uh, and then there, there are ones like flash, which I have talked about. This means basically before this I.O. happens, uh, write back anything that you have in write back cache to the media. So this, these requests are needed 
for example, when you are implementing journal link in the file systems and you really want to make sure that the data makes it to the stable storage and is not just in some write back cache on the disk itself or especially if you have clever storage, they can have gigabytes of memory in them actually. So usually they are battery backed, but not necessarily. So that's why there are these. And on standard SATA drive, the cache definitely is not battery backed. Uh, so each I.O. request goes through several phases. So it's created in the uh, I.O. Uh, in the block layer when the file system requests some data or sends some data to write. Uh, then it goes into I.O. scheduler where I.O. scheduler decides, you know, this request can wait, this request should go to the driver. It can be merged with other I.O. requests because uh, they are actually consecutive and then it's advantageous to actually merge them in a one, one larger I.O. request. Uh, there is also for especially fast devices, this I.O. scheduling actually doesn't happen. There is something which is called multi-queue handling, but we'll see it in more detail in another slide. Uh, then uh, the eventual event, the I.O. scheduler decides so, or when it goes through the multi the, the, the request is dispatched into the device driver, and device driver just directly submits it to the hardware. Uh, hardware eventually signals that the I.O. is complete via interrupt, and uh, then we call some callback of the file system saying, okay, now you, the I.O. is finished, do what you want. Uh, so here is the block layer in the detail. So from the file system comes a structure which is called bio. It basically has, again, offset, length, some pages attached and some other information. Uh, now, first actually when the uh, file system submits such bio structure, it is added to a per process plug list, so-called. So, so each process has a list of outstanding I.O. requests. When you start submitting I.O., we say that the process is actually plugged, which means that actually we are delaying the requests for a bit, awaiting whether they could be merged together. So usually the uh, experience shows that when you delay requests for a bit, you can find quite some opportunities for merging requests. So we delay these requests and, you know, either when there are like more than 60 requests accumulated or the actual bound doesn't really matter. That then we flush the list and start again. Or when, when the process goes to sleep, like for example, when it wants to wait for the IO, we will flush the plug list and actually submit it further into the block layer. Uh, now, uh, then when, when the request eventually, so when the process plug list is unplugged, uh, so we, we will submit the request either to the I.O. scheduler, which does some decisions on ordering of the requests and so on. And then the, when the I.O. scheduler decides it's time to send the request further, it will be added to so-called so dispatched queue. Now, this is a like, standard path because it's until recently for all the devices. Now for the really fast devices like PCI attached SSDs or uh, similar devices, we have now something which is called multi key handling, so uh, that's like uh, really fast, as for SO overhead, fast for devices, and it also allows for having multiple hardware queues. Uh, and uh, there, is, there is no IO scheduling basically happening, just we decide in which hardware we will send the request, and then we'll submit it to the right driver. Uh, now, Yes, we'll talk about this part in detail in the next talk, so I won't go into much detail there. Uh, so what happens actually in the I.O. schedulers? Uh, so there are three different I.O. schedulers in the kernel. First is no op, and that's a simple one uh, that basically just passes the request directly into the dispatch queue. It does no, no decisions. Uh, then there is deadline I.O. scheduler which is kind of middle ground. <coughs> so uh, the idea behind IO scheduler is that uh, the line IO scheduler is that it uh, tries to prefer reads over writes because reads tend to be more critical to the like, observed latency of the system and the experience with the system. So uh, 
it, uh, when you submit a read, then it tries to dispatch it. Uh, or when there are outstanding reads, it prefers to serve these reads against serving writes. But there are some rules so that writes aren't starved that much. I won't go into the details now. Uh, and uh, it sorts all the incoming requests by the starting sector. So like all the requests that are waiting for now are sorted. And uh, when you submit a new request, you know it's checked whether it can be merged to any of the outstanding requests. Uh, and uh, oh, sorry. Uh, and it aims to dispatch uh, each, uh, each request uh, uh, un until the deadline expires. So each request is assigned a deadline. Now the deadline is different for reads and writes. Uh, and it tries to, uh, and when the deadline actually passes, it's given really high priority and basically it's then submitted as soon as possible to the device driver. Now, uh, the most complex I/O scheduler is CFQ. Uh, it supports a lot of features uh, like I/O priorities. Okay, like I/O priorities. Uh, so basically, you can assign priority to each process, and then the process, uh, then the scheduler tries to uh, schedule requests so to achieve some kind of fairness among tasks. So each task is supposed to be given same amount of uh, same amount of time on the disk. Uh, or and IO priorities now modify weight, so so process with higher priority is given more time. Uh, in CFQ scheduler is also support for C group, so basically you could limit, uh, you could give a proportional share of the disk bandwidth to a different C uh, to each C group. Uh, CFQ actually doesn't distinguish between reads and writes; it rather distinguishes between synchronous and asynchronous <laughs> requests. Now, as I already said, reads are mostly synchronous. Uh, brides are sometimes synchronous, sometimes not, that depends. Uh, and uh, it has also other features like uh, synchronous request idling, which means that basically when the process submits synchronous requests, uh, then the CFQ will wait and won't give the throughput to, uh, and won't basically schedule I.O. from any other process for a while after this request, uh, after this process stops submitting and it waits, whether the process actually won't submit even more synchronous I.O. And the idea behind this logic is that usually these synchronous requests are related, so hopefully they will be close together on disk. Uh, so uh, this is some a way to also improve user experience. On the other hand, basically you have there periods of time where the disk is actually sitting idle doing nothing because the first process doesn't do any I.O. and you don't allow any other process to do I.O. yet. So it can uh, result in reduced throughput in some pathological cases. Yeah? yeah? Is, it, is it up to the scheduler to handle if the device is supporting NCQ, for example? Yes, the scheduler will find out whether the device supports NCQ. And uh, so basically NCQ means that uh, the device uh, can support more I.O. requests running in parallel. Normally, when you just submit one request, or that's the simplest case, you know, you submit one request, you get a result, and so on. When the device supports NCQ, it means that you can submit more requests. Each request is assigned something which is called tag, and then basically that's identifier of the request so that the driver can actually ex tell to you which request was completed and so on. And, and so the block layer will actually find out whether the device support NCQ or not, and it will assign tags to I.O. requests, and then submit as many requests as there are tags, basically. And there is also some logic between uh, of assigning tags, which is mo in most important for the multi-queue devices, for the, uh, because there it's hard, or there it's not trivial to do it in a lockless manner. But for normal devices, it's basically done under lock, and their, their logic is relatively simple. Yeah. So multi-queue device handling, as I said just briefly, uh, it's used for really fast devices, devices which have more hardware queues. It's a similar situation that has happened in networking space a few years ago. So basically to drive the heavy parallelism within the device, uh, the devices already have to expose that there are several independent queues, of, uh, there can be several independent queues of IO requests. And you can queue these requests 
to the uh, to the several hardware you use. Usually they are bound to different CPUs so that you can maintain some CPU locality and thus reduce cache bouncing and stuff like that. Uh, we, uh, for, we do no IO scheduling for such devices. There is only limited plugging where we just maintain one request in the plug queue and when another request arrives, we just try to merge it with this request. If, can be, if it can be merged, then good. If it cannot be merged, we flush the first request to the device and attach the new requests into the plug queue. Uh, and it's very lightweight, completely lockless, so on. Jens will talk about the details, so I won't spoil his talk. Uh, now, tools you can use for performance analysis. So the simplest tool is IOSTAT. Uh, I guess uh, uh, some people know it here. It's part of a systat package in the distributions, and it shows basic statistics about IO. It's very lightweight, so you, you can use it uh, without the fear that it will actually interfere with the workload you are running. Uh, so, so below is an example of how it looks output from the IOSTAT minus the XK1. Uh, the one means that basically every second the statistics are printed. And in the first column, you can see the device name. So, so these, these, here are actually results for two consecutive runs. Uh, first is device name, then there is, then two columns uh, show number of merges per second. Uh, two col the further two columns show number of reads per second, number of writes per second, and how many kilobytes were read and written per second. Then average request size, that's in sector, so we can see that there, uh, there were like six, on average, six kilobytes in each IO request for the SDA device and four kilobytes for the DM device. That's, that's one thing to bear in mind that actually for device mapper devices, these numbers are kind of bogus because they don't do real IO scheduling, IO submission. They just, the, the device mapper devices just work with BIOS. And so for example, request size is always just four kilobytes because that's the page size. You know, the real merging and IO scheduling stuff where interesting stuff happens, happens only for the real devices like SCSI devices and so on. Uh, then, Average queue size is the next column. That basically shows how many requests are waiting in the queue before they can be submitted to the, the device. Then we have average wait time, which is how long on average did the request spend in the queue before it was submitted to the device. So how, how long the request was handled in the IO scheduler. And these two numbers are in milliseconds. The third number, again in milliseconds, is service time which means the time before between the request was dispatched to the device driver till the time the request has been completed. So uh, here I have prepared a small demonstration. So here I will run some grep through the kernel tree. Uh, and here I will start run iostat minus dxk1. And here you can see that uh, there, you know, the disk is doing some 60 megabytes per second, so it's SSD, uh, SBR grepping, uh, SBR grepping through the kernel tree. There are the request sizes uh, are relatively small, you know, and you can see actually the smaller the request, the slower the IO goes. Uh, so you know, we can see it works, and I will, if I stop the search, then. You, know, you can see the numbers have dropped almost to zero. Occasionally there is some read or write basically of like changed eight times or so on, but nothing really happens anymore in the system. So that's a simple tool to use and usually you start, when you are investigating some problem, you start looking at IOSTAT data, whether there isn't something suspicious. Uh, and even though the tool is simple, you can already debug some problems with it quite successfully. So for example, here's one real customer problem when they found out that they, they, when they access the storage through Zen, block front end driver, uh, and it is kind of important that the device was actually some multi-pass storage or so going over fiber channel, uh, th then the, uh, the throughput is quite bad. So, so it was sequential write and when you are went directly, the storage was doing some 112 megabytes per second. And when going through Zen, it did only 46 megabytes per second. So it was a big difference and 
they are kind of wondering why that is. So if you look at IOSTAT numbers, the first numbers are for the direct access and there you see that we are doing a lot. Uh, and the request size is actually around 500 kilobytes. So one IO request has, has around 500 kilobytes. When you are going through Zen, you will notice that the request size is actually only 40 kilobytes. And that's due to, uh, if you look into why. why and uh, so, so one thing to know is that basically when you submit small requests like that to the IO storage, then usually the throughput really suffers. You know, the storage achieves maximum throughput around those 500 kilobytes, even the megabyte requests, that's where the storage storage is, like with traditional rotational disks, uh, achieve maximum throughput. Uh, so, so, so request size such as 40 kilobytes really make the throughput suffer. Uh, and the reason for it is, is some internal handling in the front, uh, front end driver of Zen where uh, it didn't do any request merging and it was uh, through some internal Zen bus going from Zen backend to Zen front end. It was able to pass all the requests with just a couple of pages attached, so like 10 pages attached because they didn't have more space in the structure. So when we did some, when we implemented some basic IO plugging, plugging uh, in the front end driver for Zen, the request size increased to some 256 kilobytes and the throughput increased back to 100 megabytes. So it's still not quite as direct access, but it's much closer. So <laughs> that's that's one of the example how even simple tools such as IOSTAT, yeah? So it's the IO, if you run IOSTAT minus DXK, it will just show this data, you know. I've, Yeah, yeah, it was just a file copy. Or basically, it was DD from Dev Zero to the device. You know, that that's that's so. So they were obviously first we were looking a bit into what happens. You know, there and we found that simple file copy already shows the problem. And then we started analyze. Then you you have such such a simple reproduction of the problem. Then you can analyze with the tools, or you can like we'll see in the last example that it isn't always as simple. But <laughs> yeah, this was a simple case. And I was that was enough to understand what's going on. Uh, so, take away from this uh, from this first example is that really small I/O requests hard throughput. A because you have each I/O request has some overhead in the kernel itself in the handling. B because each I/O request has an overhead in the storage itself. So the smaller request, the higher is the proportion of this overhead, and so the throughput suffers. And this holds basically for any storage device, regardless of the type, but to a different degree. Yeah? So, so <coughs> like some devices don't suffer this as much, but basically you have to find out what's true for your device because there are like devices uh, like storages you would consider the same, but actually they behave quite differently mm -hmm. in presence of small requests. Some are able to merge in internally, some are not, so depends. Now, another tool is IOWatcher. It was written by Chris Mason. Uh, the address where you can actually find and download IOWatcher is there. There is a, a Git repo on kernel.org. Uh, also, it consumes traces from block trace. I will speak about block trace a bit later. It can also come, uh, so, so block trace basically uh, traces all the actions that happen with IO request in the block layer. It can also consume MP stat output, which is showing some CPU utilization and so on. It can consume also output from FIO, uh, which is a benchmarking tool, and it will it can plot night graphs from that. So it can show throughput, latency, and so on. I will show it in a moment. It can even generate movies. So this is the first type of the graph. Uh, on the x-axis, you have time on the y-axis you have offset on the disk so you can uh, this is actually the grep through the kernel tree I have already captured when I was preparing the pre presentation you can see we are seeking quite a bit over the, uh, all over the disk it's mostly read workload naturally as it is grep occasionally there are some brights uh, but you cannot probably recognize them 
you would have to take a magnifier glass to find them. Uh, they, they are right back uh, of the updated access time uh, timestamps in the inodes. Uh, so that's first type of the graph. Second type of the graph is a throughput graph. So you can see how the throughput goes when the test was running. And again, for reads, for writes, the blue line is writes, green line is reads. Uh, we have IO latency. So it's latency of uh, average IO. This is, again, some uh, rolling <coughs> average. Uh, so we see the latency was mostly around one millisecond with some peak up to four milliseconds, some, some around 70 seconds. Uh, the number of operations per second, this is kind of similar to throughput, but sometimes it's better to look at throughput sometimes at IO operations per second. It depends what you want to compute. And this is QDAP. Now, you can, for example, notice that, so QDAP is the number of requests that are outstanding for the device. And you can notice there is a peak around second 70 and then around second 100 which kind of corresponds to the peaks in IO latency. So, which is kind of what you would expect. Like when the requests are sitting in the queue, then obviously it takes longer time, <coughs> longer time to complete them. So the graphs aren't probably made up. Now, movie time. Uh, so IO Watcher can also generate movies. So this one. Uh, so this is the movie I over can generate. On the left, you can see the throughput and the queue depth. Uh, I think we can choose different graphs there as well. Uh, in the middle, there are uh, there are like sectors which are being accessed. Now, the whole rectangle is, is actually a disk, so you have like more detailed. Mapping than in the IO in the static IO graph because this is changing over time. So you can see as we are going through this. Occasionally you can see blue lines which are basically right back of the inode tables done in the background. So it can generate movies like this, and it can be useful for analysis, as we see in the next example. So I have observed some time ago that when you and, uh, and actually, it's a known thing, you know, it, this is an example, quite old, uh, that when you enable their index featuring feature in ext3 or ext4, uh, it slows down deletion of the directory tree. So their index feature is a feature which basically builds a B tree in each directory. Uh, and this B tree <coughs> uses some, so each, each name is actually hashed, and then you have built B tree of these hashes. So, so the lookup can actually look up of a directory entry can work in a logarithmic time. It just traverses the B3 uh, and finds the entry quickly. So it's good for large directories uh, and it can speed up lookup quite significantly. But when you are deleting the whole directory, then you can see that vi without directory <coughs> index, you can delete kernel tree uh, in a bit under five seconds, but with director index, it takes over eight seconds. So it's noticeable slowdown. And now you may wonder why that is, you know, when this B3 stuff should actually speed up things, not slow down. Uh, and so you <coughs> uh, capture block traces, and then you plot them with IO Watcher. And here you can see that actually, <coughs> The I.O. isn't really sequential, but we are seeking basically between two locations at each moment. Yeah? And the throughput is quite good, you know, 20 megabytes per second, which is for this workload, like deleting lots of small files, a reasonable one. Now, if you look at the same trace, but without, uh, with the DIR index feature, you can see we are seeking much more. Uh, we are seeking between uh, more locations, you know, the, the things are further apart, it's not really so nicely sequential, so, and throughput is much lower. <laughs> so it's about <coughs> order of magnitude lower, yeah? Uh, and the reason, and when you look, in, so you can see that really seeking is the reason why, why the removal is so slower. Uh, and when you look into the 
what happens, like in more detail, you will find out uh, that the reason is that when you create directory, uh, when you have the index feature disabled, then basically you delete the files in the same order and in which they were created. And because when you are creating files, you, you will place them one after another, then delete, and when you delete them, you will again delete them one after another, so you get mostly sequential I.O. But with the index feature, you will delete the directories in the hash order. So basically you can imagine like you would first sort the files by name and then start deleting them in this order. But this is basically random order with respect to the order in which the files were created. So basically you will delete file here, 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 and you are jumping between files, uh, jumping between files in the directory, so the, I, so the deletion isn't really sequential, or is much, much more random than if you are doing it without this index feature. And the reason why, why it happens in the hash order is because basically RM first does read there, which returns the entries in the hash order, and then it goes one entry after another and deletes them. So it ends up deleting the inodes in the hash order of their names. So, yeah? Well, but you will also, so, you know, it depends. So with their index, when it is mostly random, then maybe, yeah. But I guess in practice, uh, we, you won't anyway run that many processes in parallel. And so in the end, I guess it, you won't gain performance from that. And you could possibly <laughs> destroy the sequentiality that was previously in the workload. So if you, if you would do this without the, the index feature, you would destroy the sequential, sequentiality of the removal, yeah? Because you would then delete like files from this directory, files from the directory and so on. And, and it was basically, the disk would be forced to seek even more. So I wouldn't think that actually parallelizing this, at least for an ordinary SATA drive would be beneficial. For SSD or such drive which actually don't uh, where seeking doesn't matter then yes doing it in parallel can benefit can be a benefit so seeking matters because the more you seek the smaller are chances for IO merging and obviously if you have rotational storage then the additional latency seek time and seek time between two places of a rotational disk are in order of milliseconds so it's really noticeable hit. Uh, so this, for rotational storage seeking matters even more. But that's no news, I guess. Now, block trace. Uh, block trace uh, can show very detailed information about IO requests. So uh, the good news is that it shows really all the details. Bad news is that it's so much data that unless you know what you are looking for, it's hard to <laughs> find.